Hello, my name is Paul Little and I have the privilege of serving as pastor teacher of Bib Mount Zion Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. It is my honor to welcome you to our live mobile experience as we prepare ourselves to hear God's word. We're excited about all that God is doing here in our worship experience and we wanna welcome you to the streaming services of Bib Mount Zion Baptist Church. Be blessed and enjoy the experience. <laughs> I'm so excited to see all of y'all and I'm, I'm really excited because um, one of our beloved members uh, had surgery a few weeks ago and, and the Lord has brought her back and we thank God for Sister Monica West to be back in worship with us. God bless you, Miss Monica. Not only is she here, but she drove herself here. Amen. Amen. Had uh, her second knee replacement and uh, God is so good. You feel good, Miss Monica? It's great to see you this morning, and to all of you, that anytime God brings us back from surgery and procedures and all of those things, we ought to give God thanks for that, amen? Yeah, we ought to give God thanks for that, amen. If you're out of elementary, middle, and high school, will you come sit on the stage? I'm just kidding, don't do that. Everybody turn to Joshua chapter 1. Some of y'all can't, y'all say, I can't sit down there, Pastor. Joshua chapter 1, uh, we're in a series called The Art of Advancement. This series is really um, for people who are progressively moving towards God's will for their lives. And um, we had a wonderful 8 a.m. worship this morning and uh, just excited to see how God blessed us at the 8 a.m. worship. And for those of you who may be looking for a more abbreviated worship experience, 8 a.m. worship is from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. And uh, we just have a wonderful time. Our music ministry leads us in a high energy uh, time of worship. And, and we just thank God for how the Lord is blessing that particular worship experience. Amen. Is that Brother Weaver in the back? Come step in the door for me, Brother Weaver. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but that's what I do. I'm anointed to do that. Amen. Will y'all give God, God, I want you to sit, y'all, Brother Bean, can you let this gentleman sit right here by you? That's Brother Bean Alexander right here. I want you to sit by him and his wife, Miss Anita. I want y'all to meet Brother Verbin Weaver. He's a young brother um, who has recently put his name in the hat to run for the mayor position of the city of Macon. Amen. So let's welcome him to build Mount Zion. We welcome him and we appreciate you for coming and being with us. He texted me this morning to let me know he would be here. We met a few weeks ago, and I'm very happy and excited about having you here. We're going to be talking a little bit more about civic engagement uh, because we do realize that you cannot have uh, a spiritual reality in this world without there being some social intersection. If you read the Bible, you know that there is no disconnection between the spiritual and the social or the political. So much of what Jesus taught us has to do with our responsibility to be salt and light in the earth. And we must be aware of the various things that are happening in our world so that we can address those things from a kingdom perspective. Does that make sense? Joshua 1, beginning at verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. 
have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you'll remove hindrances, distractions, anything that will keep us from gladly and sincerely receiving your word this morning. I pray that from the youngest to the eldest that your word will be clear and applicable so that we may all hear it and apply it to our everyday lives. Bless us now as we receive your word and have your way in and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray that all of God's people say together, amen, amen. I meant to have y'all to stand for the reading of the word again as, as I've been doing the past few weeks, so that was my mistake. Thank you, Sister Broadnax. She the only one said it's all right. The Art of Advancement is really a series for people who are not comfortable with comfort. It is a series for people who recognize that God does not save an individual in order for that individual to stand still. But being saved is about movement. It is about progress. It is about growth. It is about moving forward in life so that God is glorified in our lives as we do his will. There are some biblical words that Bible writers use to describe this process. One of those words is called sanctification. Let the church say sanctification. It is this idea that God is maturing me. He is purifying me when I enter into relationship with him so that I will become a new person, so that I will be uh, the, representative, the representative of his kingdom and his will while I'm here on earth. There's another word that the Bible uses to talk about our progress or our advancement as Christians. There's this word that is called transformation. Let the church say transformation. It is the idea that God takes my life once I put my life in his hands. Stay with me, young people. And he totally renovates my life so that I become a reflection of his will. In Romans chapter 2, Paul the Apostle talks about how we are transformed through the renewing of our minds, that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. It is when we surrender our thoughts and surrender our hearts and our, our, our very lives to God that we see God move in our lives so that we become new believers. This text that I have been preaching about for the past three weeks is about an individual whose name is Joshua. And as we said in the first week, he is the leader of the children of Israel, and they are God's chosen people in the Old Testament. They have just come out of a place called the wilderness. It is this uh, indescript land that after coming out of slavery, they did not enter into God's will or God's best for their lives. But because of their parents, their disobedience of, of their parents, they wandered in the wilderness. And so the foreparents of the people in this story are individuals who are now having to pick up the pieces, if you will, and experience God in a new way because they were born during the time that their parents was in this place that is called the wilderness. The wilderness, if you are listening to me this morning, it is this place that says, Brother Robert, I'm not where I was but I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I, I, I'm not totally where I, I'm going, but at the same token, I'm not back where I was. Remember, they had just left Egypt, which represents being enslaved to sin. And the wilderness represents spiritual infancy or spiritual immaturity. But they're headed to a place called the promised land, which represents spiritual abundance. They are transitioning, they are moving progressively towards God's will, but they have not yet arrived at that place. And one of the most powerful things that we can do as people of God is have moments of authenticity and transparency where we recognize that there are some areas in our lives that are not totally in line with where God wants us to be. Yeah, one of the best things we can do is be honest about where we are. Because until we're honest about where we are, we cannot move forward to where God will have us to be. And here in Joshua chapter 1, as we said during the first week, Moses, the original leader of the group, has died. 
And Joshua is now called to take the responsibility to lead the children of their, the foreparents, the, the first generation, into this place called the promised land, which represents spiritual abundance. It really, the promised land, represents what we would call God's best for our lives. And I really want to take my time to walk through this because I believe, as we said during the intro of this particular sermon series, that some of us have simply settled for where we are. And we have given up on God's will, but when all, in all actuality, God did not call you to settle and to be stagnant, but he called you to move progressively towards his best for your life. And right here in chapter number one, we find, as we discovered on last week, that there were some essential things that Joshua and the Israelites would need, some essential ingredients, if you will, that Joshua and the Israelites would need in order for them to have a successful journey. On last week, if you weren't here, let me just drop this real quick. They were in need of God's protection. Everybody say God's protection. You, you can watch the playback of this on Facebook or at the BMZ app to get all of the notes from that. Uh, get the CD, the DVD, the cassette, or the 8-track from the media team. They'll hook you up. But I want to focus this morning on the second ingredient that Joshua and the Israelites needed as they're preparing for transition. This is the second ingredient. This is the second necessity that Joshua and the Israelites needed to have while they are transitioning from the wilderness of spiritual immaturity into the promised land of spiritual abundance. Are y'all interested this morning? Number two, here it is. Here's the second necessity. They needed God's precepts. Everybody say God's precepts. It's in verses 7 and 8, but let me define this, everybody. Precepts uh, are God's guiding principles. And these guiding principles, like I shared with the elementary school students a moment ago, they are instructions from God. They are directions or directives from God that will lead us to where God will have us to go. I, I, I'm, I'm looking out. I see a lot of college students in here. If you're in college, let me see your hand real quick. Let me see your hand. Yeah, look around. That's a lot of college students in here. Oh, yeah, give, give God praise. That's a lot of college students in here. So, 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 so let me see if I can say this to, for all the college students that are sitting here. Um, when we talk about God's precepts, it is, it is God's syllabus. Uh, at the beginning of the semester, we get, Ryan, what is called a, a syllabus, right? You, you know this. And, and that syllabus lays out the direction that we're going for the entire course. What, what God is doing for Joshua, everybody, is he's giving them the syllabus with the set of instructions that they're going to need in order for them to pass the class. And, and while they are following the syllabus, everybody, don't miss it, it will require a series of tests. That will determine whether or not they succeed or fail. But if you look at the word of God, put, put the verses, verses 6 and 7 up on the screen. Here's the good thing about it, uh, verse 7. Here's the good thing about it. When God gives the syllabus, notice according to verse 7, it's open book. <laughs> that God doesn't give a test that he has not yet giving you the information from. But, but notice what happens in, in, in verses 7 and 8 when God gives the precepts or the instructions to the people. He reiterates the command that he gave Joshua at the beginning of verse 6. He says, be strong and courageous in verse 6. But then in this verse, he puts emphasis on courageous and says, be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which, my, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Notice the lesson is that obeying God's word requires strength and courage. And this is so powerful and so significant because there are times when God will command us to do things that don't make logical sense. Yeah, and we see this principle played out in Joshua's story. Can, can I fast forward to the story and then come back to verse number one? Do y'all mind? In a few weeks, we're going to talk about Joshua 
having to fight a battle in a place called Jericho. Let me show you how God is setting Joshua up. And then when we get to that part of the sermon series, we'll, we'll go there in detail. But let me give you some direction as to why God gives Joshua the command to be strong and courageous. Because sometimes God will command you to do something that challenges your logical intellect. When he gets to Jericho, here's what God says. Young people, y'all still with me over here? Okay, watch me. He goes to, and he says, Joshua, take the people. Go to Jericho. I've already given you this land, but there are some instructions that you're going to have to follow in order to get it. Joshua, I want you to take the people, and I want you to walk around Jericho seven times. Now, listen to the instructions. Tell the people that while y'all are walking around the wall, don't nobody say nothing. Now, a couple people have already done disqualified us from the blessing. Because here, here go some of us walking around the wall talking about, child, what the Lord got us doing this for? This don't make no doggone sense. Some of y'all going to look like those little children walking around the sanctuary a minute ago like, what in the world is going on? But God says, I want you to walk and I don't want you to say nothing for seven times. Some of us going to be at the wall taking selfies, talking about, girl, lean over, lean over. And God says, no, 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 don't say nothing. But on the last, when you get to the last part of it, I want you to shout and make a lot of noise. He's telling Joshua in advance, be strong and courageous. Why? Because sometimes obeying the word is not going to make logical sense to you. But by following his word, it leads us and it guides us to places that we normally could not go. Listen to what he says about the word of God. Are y'all staying with me? He says, don't turn from the word. Don't swerve. Don't waver to the right or the left. Stay with my word. What, what he's teaching Joshua and he's teaching us, everybody, is the power of consistency. Everybody say consistency. Because it's not enough to obey God's word for a specific time period or follow the word every now and then. We are called to follow God's word consistently regardless of what other people say, regardless of how we feel, and regardless of what we think. It is a lifestyle of obedience. Don't swerve to the right or the left. Stick with my word. Even when the world is saying everything else is acceptable, stick with my word. Even when the, word tell, the world tells you that you can do this and be acceptable in God's sight, you got to stick with the word. And don't swerve to the right or to the left. That's a lifestyle of obedience. The Lord desires for us to make obedience a daily habit that shapes every decision we make. But notice what the Bible says at verse number at the end of verse 7. There is the byproduct of obeying God's word in verse number 7. Everybody got your Bible, your phone, your tablet? Look at it on the screen if you need to. Obey God's word. Don't observe to do everything according to the word. Don't swerve from the to the right or the left. Here's the line, here's the line, here's the line, Brother Bing. This is the one that you may prosper wherever you go. Thank you for the one person that clapped over to my right. That you may, everybody say prosper. Okay, let's do some homework. The, the word prosper here, it means to advance, to progress, or to be profitable. The Lord desires for his children to advance, to progress, and to be profitable. Let me give you some scripture references for you to hold on to. That's a reference to this point. Psalm 35 verse 27 says that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God is pleased. God is happy. God is excited to bless his children. Can I give you some New Testament? Third John, I wish above all things. I wish I had a few Bible students. Any Bible readers? I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. 
God desires for us to prosper. He didn't save you for you to sit on the sideline and just accept whatever comes in your life. God wants you to prosper. And prosperity, brothers and sisters, does not indicate the absence of struggles and battles. As a matter of fact, you'll discover that when God is prospering you, the devil and all the forces of, of hell are going to try to keep you out of God's will for your life. But when you know that God has called you to prosper, you can go through every battle already knowing that you're going to win in the end. When you just touch yourself and just say, I'm going to win in the end. It's tough right now. It's difficult right now. But it is God's will that I advance that I progress and that I am profitable. God, God didn't save me to be stuck and stagnant. He wants to prosper every area of my life. And it's important to recognize that our ability to follow instructions will determine whether we prosper or not. God does not prosper disobedient people. He prospers those who live in consistent obedience to his word. But can I give you the qualifier that I love about this statement? Listen to it again. Observe to do everything that the Lord has commanded you. Don't turn to the right or the left. Stick with my word that you may prosper wherever you go. Every time I read it, my, my soul gets excited. Let me, let me see if I can get y'all to wake up and get excited with me. Listen to it. Listen, you cannot disconnect this one verse from the previous verses in the chapter. So, so Ms. Brenda, let's, let's, let's pull it all together to see what God is saying to us in this text. If you read in a few verses prior, listen to what the Lord said to Joshua. Joshua, I'm promising to give you the wilderness, the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, down to the Mediterranean, and then he says, wherever your foot shall trot. All of that is yours. As a matter of fact, he tells them first, wherever your foot is going to try, I'm going to give that to you. But then he gives them specific locations, Brother Alvin, that they're going to take hold of if they follow him. But watch what this statement says. When you follow God, not only will he give you specific blessings, he gives us prosperity that has universal appeal. <laughs> Which means that the favor of God is not limited to geographical locations. Because if I stick with God's word, I can shift from having to ask God about every detail and every decision. Because if I stay in the word, God's going to prosper me, read the line, wherever I go. I, I, need, I need to help a college student with that. If you stick with God's word, whatever job you take, you're going to prosper. Wh whatever relationship you have, if you obey, the, and obey God's word, it's going to prosper. Because you cannot obey God's word and not be transformed by the word. So God doesn't have to worry about your decision making when you stick with the word. You ought to show up at school tomorrow. Are y'all out of school too this week? Okay, I'm sorry. Whenever y'all, whenever so never y'all go back to school, you ought to show up in class and say the class is blessed because I'm here. Somebody ought to go to their job and say it's a blessed atmosphere where I am. Quit going to your job being depressed. Talking about they don't like me. I don't like working here. No, it's blessed because I'm here. Because he said, wherever I go, it's going to be blessed. When I go to school this week, I ought to go in with a mindset of confidence and assuring, knowing that it's blessed because I am following God's word. You cannot put a limitation on how and where God blesses you. If you obey the word, you're going to be blessed wherever you go. Okay, somebody's looking at me funny. Let me give you some scripture for this. Psalm 1. Thank you, Jay, for reading it earlier. He didn't know I was going to preach about this. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the person that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his or her delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it does he or she meditate day and night. And he or she will be like a river planted by the streams of water that brings forth fruit in each season. His or her leaves shall not wither. Here's the line, here's the line, and whatever you do is going to prosper. 
you waiting on God. God said, I'm waiting on you. Whatever you do is going to prosper when you obey my word. Because when you obey God's word, God has already given you the information and the direction that you need. You don't have to ask God. It's some, it's some calls I get. I don't have to ask God what to do about it because I know it ain't God's will for me. When you're in tune with the word, God is talking to you when you're in tune with the word. So anytime you're confused about a decision to make, who should I marry, who should I date, what job, what major, should I change my major, should I keep my major, should I take this job, should I move to this career, it's an indication that you need to get in God's word. Because when you get in God's word and you obey God's word, you're going to prosper wherever you go. Can you give God praise for the promise that there's no limitations on his favor? Somebody shout, wherever I go is going to be blessed. Now, now notice, notice how he, he pushes this now. He pushes this further in verse number 8. We're going to just walk through it. The, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Just stop right there for a minute. This book of the law. Everybody say, this book of the law. It is a reference to the book of Deuteronomy. In the Old Testament, there are five books that scholars call the book of Moses, uh, the Pentateuch, Penta, five, Tuk, words, law, the law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These five books of the Bible are the foundational books to the direction that God was going to lead his people. So watch what happens. He, he wrote this book and gave the inspiration to Moses to write this, this book called Deuteronomy, which means second law. Okay, let me tell you what's the reason why it's called second law. God had given, had given them the instructions firsthand, but they missed it. So, so here, is, here is how wonderful God is. God is so wonderful, he says, I don't mind giving you the instructions again because this is the only way you're going to be blessed. Okay, y'all didn't, didn't get that. Let me see all the parents in the house, let me see your hands. All the parents, you are a parent. Okay, all right. If you are a parent, then you understand this. Repeating yourself is a part of your job description. Am I, am I lying or telling the truth? Yeah, re repeating yourself is just a part of what you have to do. Now, you say stuff like this. I ain't going to say this no more. And you end up saying it again. <laughs> Listen to how wonderful this is when you think about God. God could have given them the message, and when they messed up, God could have said, I ain't going to say it no more. But notice what he does. He says, let me repeat my instructions to you. Because if I don't repeat it to you, you're not going to be blessed. Anybody glad that God gives remedial courses? <laughs> I, I want to have a moment of transparency. Anybody ever flunk some classes with God, but he let you take it again? Don't y'all act like y'all never failed no classes with God. I said, anybody ever fail some instruction that God gave you, but he gave it over? He, he'll let you retake the test even though, and here's the good thing about it. He always grades on a curve. You know what it's called? It's called Grace. I should have flunked out of God's school, but God gave me another opportunity to hear the word again. God said, it ain't a problem for me to repeat myself to y'all. So when he said this book of the law, he's talking about a singular book. It's the book of Deuteronomy. Because he's having to repeat himself over and over again. So listen to what he tells the people. This book shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night. Now, this verse, verse 8, is an analogy. It's an illustration. Let me see if I can help you with it. Don't let the word depart from your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. Now, I don't want you to let your westernized understanding of what meditation means cause you to lose what this text is really saying. Because when you think about meditation, you think about thinking about something over and over again. And that is an implication of this verse. 
but it's not totally what it means. The word is spiritual food. And we are to feed on the word. Don't let it depart from our mouths, but meditate in it. That word meditate in the Hebrew language means to chew on. Let me give you the word. Here, here's what it means. Uh, the Hebrew language, there are word pictures that describe what one word means. You ever study Hebrew? It's very interesting. In the book of Hebrew, the word meditate, Deacon Grant, is the picture, literally the picture of a cow eating cud. Meditate. Carlos, the cow is eating the cud. Now, here's what you got to know about the cows. The cows has four stomachs that they compartmentalize different food sources. So when a cow is malnourished, they could go back and eat some more, which they do, but oftentimes they take what is already in them and they regurgitate it and keep chewing on it. You cannot let... The word of God be something you receive one time. Every time you hear the word preached or taught, you ought to chew on it through the week. And sometimes when you have moments where you're feeling spiritually malnourished, you got to go back in and get the word that was already spoken. You felt sick this week, so you had to go back and get the word and said, by his stripes, I'm already healed. You've had times where you didn't feel like you had peace, so you had to go and pull that word back up. His peace that surpasses all understanding is going to guard my heart and mind. You've had some times where you felt inadequate, and you had to pull that word back out that says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You can't regurgitate the word when you need it if you ain't never chewed on it in the first place. Hey, I ain't going to ask y'all to do this all year because I know people don't like to do this no more, but this is the, probably the one, one of the only times this year. Just bump somebody and tell them, you need to eat today. Listen, I wish I had 10 people that can testify. I didn't come to be entertained. I came to eat. I, I, I ain't come to see nobody perform on the pulpit. I came to eat because I recognize when this word gets in my spirit, I can bring it back up when I need it. Sometimes we don't have any reserves to pull from because we ain't chewing on the word enough. We're chewing on social media. We're chewing on, 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 on housewives. We're, chew, we're chewing on a whole lot of stuff. But you got to get that word in your spirit. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart so that I may not sin against God. The word is the answer. You got to chew on that word. And sometimes, sometimes we are malnourished in the area because we hadn't feasted on the word. That term meditate means to chew on and to bring it back up when needed. Now, guess when you need to do it? You need to do it day and night. Don't miss it. Daytime when it seems like everything is well. Daytime, when, when things look good, it's light, I can see my way, it's easy to obey God a lot of times in the daytime, but you also got to do it at night, when it looks dark, when it feels like things are not coming together for me. I still have to chew on the word even when seasons change. That's why he didn't say just meditate in it. He says do it day and night because even though seasons change, the word don't. As a matter of fact, Jesus says it like this, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my word by no means will pass away. Somebody say, I need the word. And notice that the word of God, when we meditate in it, it does something supernatural for us. We meditate in it day and night, and we can prosper. Listen, everybody. And then have good success. Prosper means to advance, progress, and to be profitable. Good success, another way of putting it, Brother Earl, godly success. Pastor, why is this important that the word, verse 8, specifically 
puts a descriptive on success. If I ask you to say, do you want to be successful? Most people say, yeah. But listen to what the word says. No, you want good success, which implies there's a such thing as bad success. You know what bad success is? Bad success is prospering according to the world's standards, but being displeased by God. So you feel like because you got a job with a lot of money, you're successful. You feel like you have a lot of a, a big house and a lot of land, you're successful. You feel like because you got money in the bank, you're successful. But it's a whole lot of people that got a whole lot of stuff, but God is not pleased with their lives. Here's what success is, because success, young people, it matters how you define it. Success is when I accomplish God's will for my life. Period. It's not determined by what's on my body. It's not determined by how much jewelry and how much stuff I acquire. It is determined as to whether or not I am achieving God's specific purpose for why I'm on this earth. That's called good success. Now, here's the beautiful thing about God. His measure of success will bring about blessings that oftentimes are material when he knows I can handle it. Think about it. When they got to the promised land, they didn't just go in and, and just, you know, kind of sit down and chill. It was, it was, it was beautiful. It was, it was physically attractive. As a matter of fact, the land is described as a place, millennials, that's flowing with milk and honey. I always wondered that. Why milk and honey? It's, it's very easy when you think about it. Milk is necessary for the strength of our bodies. You need milk because without milk, it uh, stiffens the bones. This is what we call osteoporosis. You, you, if you don't have strong bones, then, then it shuts down your body and you become paralyzed. You need milk. It's, necess it's, ne it's a necessity. But watch this. Honey is not a necessity. It represents the sweet things of life that are pleasurable. You don't have to have honey to live. It's just good to have. God says if you follow me, You'll get milk, all the stuff that you need, and the honey. That's the stuff that you desire as long as I know you in my will. But you can't prosper and have good success until you stick with God's precepts. That's his word. Somebody say, I need the word. But here's the last thing. We need God's protection. We need God's precepts. Here's the last thing. We need... God's presence. Somebody just say that. I got to have God's presence. Look at verse number 9 of Joshua 1. Here's the third time he's going to say this one phrase. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. It's the third time in these verses. Why? Because there's an emphasis on strength and courage. You're going to need this. And by the way, Joshua, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Don't, don't faint and give up. Why, Joshua? For the Lord your God is with you. There's that phrase again, wherever you go. Now, by reading that, it should have ignited something in your spirit. But just to solidify it a little bit further, let me explain to you what that means. We don't have to be afraid when we go through transitions in life because we are connected to the almighty God who is omnipresent. Now, let me tell you what omnipresence means and what it does not mean. It is the fullness of God's presence everywhere I go. Omnipresence is not... A little bit of God is over here, and a little bit of God is over here, and a little bit of God is out there. No, everywhere I go, the fullness of God 
is present wherever I go. It's a theological term. Everybody say omnipresence. But, but, but here's the thing. The fullness of God's presence is only experienced when I consistently recognize or acknowledge his presence. Because here's, here, here's what I want to show us, Jay. Just because God is present doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to experience him. Now, wait, 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 Pastor. You just said God is always present. But, but listen, God can be present and you not recognize it. This is what in the world of theology, studying the scriptures, this is what we call the manifested presence of God. It is God, watch this, revealing himself to me when I recognize that he's there. Okay, let me give you some scripture. Uh, jot down Mark chapter 5, entire chapter. Here's what we understand, Brother Robert. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus, who is God, God's presence in human form, going through an area called the Gadarenes. Everybody say the Gadarenes. Jesus and his disciples in, ver in Mark chapter 4, they get off of a boat that was a storm. They get off the boat, and as soon as they get off the boat, a man runs up to Jesus who is possessed with demons. Jesus healed the man of demons. While Jesus is walking, a well-known leader named J. Iris comes up to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, my little girl who's 12 years old is sick. Can you come by the house and heal her? Jesus says, Sure. While Jesus is walking, there's a woman who has an issue of blood for 12 years who comes behind Jesus and touched the bottom of his robe, and she was healed. Jesus spoke a word of healing to the little girl who died at the age of 12. So in one chapter, he healed a man from demons, a woman from a disease, and a girl from death. All in one chapter. It's Mark chapter 5. Everybody got it? When we turn the page and go over to chapter 6, Minister Brandy, the Bible said that Jesus shows up in his hometown of Nazareth and listen to this line, everybody. He could not do any miracles there. Listen to it now. In chapter 5, this is Jesus who healed a man from demons, a woman from disease, and a little girl from death. But he gets to his hometown. And because, don't miss this, the people are so familiar with him, they missed his presence. Let me help you with it. Because anytime we treat God as familiar and casual, he can't move in our lives. Now, let me bring this all together for you. That's why it's an indication. See, you know, young, you know, you're a young pastor. You come in, you know, you first get started. Come on, everybody praise the Lord. Everybody praise the Lord. See, I don't, I don't have time for that no more because here's what I understand. When you show up and recognize God's presence on your own, it's something that happens in your relationship with God. I used to be like, why this person ain't praising God? Why this person ain't praising God? No, 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 no. Think about it like this. When God's presence shows up, if you are in tune with God's presence, you automatically give God praise because you acknowledge that praise is your recognition that he just showed up. Okay, you want scripture for it. The Bible literally says that God inhabits or dwells in an atmosphere where there is praise. And the fact that you come to God's house and never move is an indication that you have low expectation of what God can do in your life. Because praise is for those who recognize that when God gets in the room, something is about to shift. Listen, I've been in, I've been in worship experiences at other places and churches I preached at, and somebody, and somebody coming to me and said, man, you sure preached a good word, but it seemed like worship was dead. Not to me. I got what I needed. Y'all waiting on people. I ain't tripping on that. I came for him. You came to see what somebody got on. You came to see what, who's going to lead your favorite song. No, no, no. I came because I recognize that when I get in God's presence, something is going to happen in my life. I ain't never had a bad day of worship. And God's presence, when acknowledged, 
is not limited to the sanctuary. You've been in God's, in the car with God and felt his presence. You've been on the job and felt God's presence. You've been in Target and, and, and Walmart and Kmart. We don't have that anymore. But you've been everywhere and felt God's presence because when God's presence show up and you acknowledge him, you can't help but to feel something. It's your relationship with God. Because God's presence, when acknowledged, he reveals himself. So that's how Jesus could do miracles in chapter 5 and not in chapter 6. Okay, I'll give you another example. Luke chapter 5. Jesus shows up and he's teaching in a place called Capernaum and he's in a house. The Bible said it was so crowded in the house, it started, people couldn't even get in. But look what it says. Jesus was teaching, here it is, and the Lord's presence was there to heal them. Why does God ever to put specific emphasis on the fact that God's presence? We ought to think that if Jesus is there, the presence is automatically there. Yes, but sometimes Jesus shows up at your circumstance and you don't even know it. And don't you let pain and trouble be an indication that God is not there. Because God even shows up in pain. I need to stretch your faith a little bit this morning. God shows up in hard times. God shows up when I lose a loved one. God shows up when I lost a job. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he is a very present help in time of trouble. How is he very present in time of trouble? The way that verse literally means is that God is more present in times of trouble. I'll give it to you again like this. The Bible says that he is very present. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. Guess what the Bible also says, Brother Alvin? That God is close to those who are brokenhearted. You felt because you were in pain that God wasn't there. God said, my presence is so strong that you can't limit my presence to pain or pleasure. I'm there in the good times, the bad times, the ups and downs. I was there during the surgery. I was there before the surgery. I was there after the surgery. I've been there the whole time. The question is, have you acknowledged me? Joshua, you're going to need my presence. It don't matter, it don't matter who, who, who dies out on this journey as long as I'm there. Watch this, everybody. Here's the beautiful thing about it. Seek God, seek God's presence, and you will get God's presence. Okay, let me help you with it. Seek God's presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, and you will get God's presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. I got people who can't spell good, so let me say it another time. (laughs) Seek God for who he is, and he'll show up and bless you with what you need. Because according to the scriptures, God never shows up empty-handed. Can I give you some Bible verses? In his presence is the fullness of joy. You can't stay in God's presence and stay depressed. And at his right hand, there are pleasures evermore. You can't stay in God's presence long enough and not have peace. It is his presence that's the difference maker. And Joshua, when you go through all of these battles and all of these storms, as long as I'm there, you'll be all right. Let me close by giving you a word from David who testified about how powerful God's presence is. Psalm 139, just read it when you get home. David asked a few questions. Lord, where can I go from your presence? Where where can I hide from your spirit? If I go up to heaven, you're going to be there. Watch David, everybody. This ought to make you happy. If I make my bed in hell, you will be there. If I go to the deepest parts of the sea, you will be there. You can't outscape, outrun or escape God's presence. As a matter of fact, thank you, Holy Ghost, that was a fellow who tried that with God. Name was Jonah. He said, I'm going to run from the presence of God. God told Jonah, hey, bro, wherever you go, you're going to bump into me. You can't outrun God. And when you recognize that God's presence is the difference maker in your life, you wake up daily. Watch me, everybody, acknowledging his presence. You know what? Getting up in the morning and going about your day without talking to God, you're saying, I'm not aware of your presence and I don't need you today. 
You started work, you started school, you started class, you started a job. You did all of that without taking some moments to say, God, on this day, I'm going to need your presence. Young people, I need y'all to hear this. Somebody's going to say something to me. Something's going to happen. I'm going to be tested. And it is the where, it is the awareness of God's presence that will keep you out of trouble. You being aware of God's presence kept you out of jail. You being aware of God's presence kept you from saying something ungodly to somebody who said something ungodly to you. And when the Spirit of God is present, the Bible says there is liberty or freedom. Joshua, I'm going to protect you. Joshua, I'm going to give you my precepts. That's instruction. But Joshua, you're going to need my presence. And here's the last thing about it. I'll be with you wherever you go. Can I see the hands of those who can declare, this is my word for this season for where I am right now. I just need to know that God, listen, I, anybody can stand real quick. Come on, stand real quick. I, I just needed the reassurance that God is with me. Because guess what, everybody? Sometimes you get in your feelings and you say, I don't, I don't, I don't feel God. I don't know if God is present in my life. I don't know if God is present in this situation. God says, no, 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 don't, don't, don't determine my presence based on how you feel. God can be present, and you can be so busy thinking about old boy, so busy thinking about old girl, so busy thinking about this job. Listen, so some of us come to church, come to worship, and you already in, you in worship mapping out what you're going to eat after church. Now, if we get out at 12.15, if Pastor Hush by 12.15, I can cut over to, what you call it, get there on time, catch the crowd, do the. You got your mind, you got to have your mind like set. Not, not being there talking about, oh, what can I, checking the phone every five minutes. Presence. His presence. His presence. It is, it is his presence. When I come, I'm making an intentional decision to say, God, I want to be aware that you are present. Can we be honest? Sometimes we let sluggishness. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. How you doing? Oh, had a long weekend. Join the club. We all have. <laughs> Let's get in his presence. There is strength in his presence. You got stuff on your mind. When you get in God's presence, that's, the, that's your way of turning it over. You have literally missed some answers to prayer because you were sitting in God's presence and didn't recognize it. There were times where God has been talking to me about something and I had to go back and kind of think about it again and say, you know, God put that in my spirit a few weeks ago and I blew right by it. You know why? Because sometimes we get so caught up in life and stuff and work and this and that. Listen to what God says. In order for you to Live in my presence, you got to understand this principle called stillness. Oh, I've been practicing this for the last couple of months in a way like I've never practiced it. Sometimes it's, 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 it's grandmama's language when it's raining outside. Right? Y'all remember? When, 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 it, when, it's, when it's raining, go, go, go sit down somewhere. The Lord is working. Unplug. Watch this. Disconnect from that stuff. Unplug this. See, you were missing the spiritual revelation in it. It's, sit down. Let the Lord do his work. And sometime in life, when the Lord is moving, you know what God is saying to us? Go sit down somewhere. Listen. Listen to me. See, you have to, we have to get to a place in our relationship with God. Watch this, everybody. That when you spend time with him consistently... On the spot, you can hear God just like that. Like some decisions are not, uh, let, give me two days, let me go pray about it. Sometimes you, you do have time to do that. Sometimes you don't. I had a person call me one day a couple years ago. Man, we got this great opportunity for you. And as the person was talking, I didn't even have to pray about it. 
You ever been there before? I ain't need to talk to God about this. No, that's okay. You got you to be in tune. Are you, are you on the same frequency as God? God is on FM, you on AM. You got to get on the same frequency and say, okay, God, I hear you. And when you're interacting with people, watch this, everybody. How many times have, have God spoken to you through somebody and you missed it? Because didn't, you didn't like the way they said it or you didn't like who said it. I'm going to preach about that next Sunday. What do you do when the answer that God gives you doesn't look like what you think it should? It is his presence. It is his presence. It is his presence. Father, I pray that everybody in this sanctuary, from the youngest to the eldest, would develop a more keen sensitivity to your presence. While these college students are on campus, while these teenagers and middle schoolers and elementary school, elementary school students are at school, while every adult is on their job or at home or interacting with family, Help us to be aware of your presence. In your presence, there is the fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Thank you for your presence. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody need to come to be saved today? I want to make a few invitations. You want to be saved today. How do you do that? You just simply confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You shall be saved. You shall be saved. If you need to do that this morning, will you just step out in the nearest aisle? If you just step out in the nearest aisle, somebody from our ministerial team or our starting point team will direct you in the way that you need to go in order to be saved. Everybody who needs to be saved. There's a number. If we'll put the number on the screen, you can text this number and you can join or accept Christ via text. Somebody's going to call you and do that with you over the phone, get some information to you and to help you to walk through this process of developing a closer relationship with the Lord. If anyone need to be saved today? Anyone need to be saved today? Hello once again. I hope you were blessed by the worship experience on today. I pray that God's word spoke to your heart, spoke to your mind. And if you're interested in having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to contact us via our website or one of our social media platforms. And we'll be sure to contact you this week about how you can draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I hope you enjoyed the experience. Have a great day.